Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Advancing Neuroscience, Functional Insights from In Vitro Microelectrode Arrays. I am Dr. Stacy Kavatal of Axion Biosystems, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Axion Biosystems. Axion Biosystems is a life science company focused on solving problems related to human heart and brain activity. We have commercialized the first multi-well microelectrode array platform, the Maestro, which you will hear more about shortly. Today's webinar is focused on neural applications using the Maestro, and we will hear from some great speakers doing cutting-edge research in pain and autism applications. We have a few announcements before we begin. Please take a moment to answer the poll seen on your screen. We're just trying to gauge your level of awareness in MEA technology. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button on the lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Daniel Millard is an application scientist at Axion Biosystems. He will provide a brief introduction to MEA technology and the Maestro platform. Next, Dr. Carol Marchetto from the Salk Institute will speak about using the Maestro to explore network level signaling in an in vitro autism model. Then Dr. John Graves from Bristol Myers Squibb will present on pain modeling using dorsal root ganglion neurons. I will now turn it over to Dr. Daniel Millard for an introduction to MEA technology and the Maestro platform. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Daniel Millard, as Stacy mentioned. I'm a senior application scientist at Axion Biosystems. Uh, and today I'd like to give a brief introduction to microelectrode array technology and the Maestro uh, MEA platform and how these tools can be used for advancing neuroscience and neural applications. First, I'd like to start with a brief review of uh, some recent trends in life science instrumentation. Um, first is the development of stem cells as tools, which has really enabled us to get human biology in a dish faster and better than ever before. Uh, also, the, these tools, the stem cells being used as tools, uh, has, has uh, led to a resurgence of phenotypic screening, and in particular the use of disease in dish models to take human disease phenotypes and mimic them in vitro. And then finally, um, the, the use of stem cells and other uh, uh, cellular models for drug discovery and drug safety and toxicology has led to a significant animal reduction, which is a, a, a government mandate by a number of uh, organizations uh, in the world. Uh, together, these trends uh, highlight the desire to model complex human systems in vitro. And there's a number of reasons why we would want to do this. And the first is uh, the ability to take um, complex uh, biology, these key biological variables for electroactive cells, such as excitation, inhibition, intracellular signaling, and gene expression, and be able to map those key biological variables um, to function. Uh, and microelectrode arrays provide a direct measure of function for electroactive cells by measuring the electrophysiology um, that arises as these key bi biological variables are, um, are manipulated in the cell culture. A microelectrode array uh, it, it ha is, is based off of a technology of embedding microelectrodes into a substrate of a dish um, such that cells can be plated into that dish. Those cells then integrate directly with the electrodes and also with each other um, so that the electrode array can track individual action potentials and their propagation across the network. An example of the raw voltage trace um, that is detected by uh, the electrode um, uh, was, was shown there in yellow and, and with um, – and by doing some simple processing, we can detect the action potentials extract them as the extracellular action potential waveform, um, 
such, a, such that each electrode is detecting activity from one or a few cells. Now, with the microelectrode array, where we have multiple electrodes within a well, we're able to capture uh, the activity from not just one electrode, but multiple electrodes. In this case, we have a four by four grid of electrodes with each electrode detecting action potentials from one or a few neurons located in close proximity to the, uh, to the electrode. And there are numerous advantages to having multiple electrodes within a well, um, with the first being the ability to sample many cells as opposed to just a single cell. And this allows the characterization of connectivity across uh, those different cells within the network, leading to truly network phenotypes uh, and the ability to quantify these for neural applications. And this significantly enhances the reliability and reproducibility of the data. As Stacy mentioned before, the Maestro is the first platform um, to combine microelectrode array technology with a multi-well format, with an industry-leading 768 electrodes distributed across 12, 48, or 96 wells, uh, which uses, with each of these multi-electrode um, uh, array plates being ANSI-compliant and interchangeable uh, with, with the Maestro recording hardware. And each of these electrodes is multifunctional. And what I mean by that is that each electrode can be used to both record the raw voltage uh, that is uh, uh, um, uh, elicited by the electrophysiological changes of the cells, but also to stimulate or activate uh, the cells nearby the, uh, the electrodes. In addition, there is a heating plate uh, underneath the, the, the microplate in the maestro to maintain physiological temperature, and the EC mini environmental control accessory that helps to maintain CO2 um, and physiological pH. Uh, and this is important as it allows long-term recording by keeping the cells in a stable environment. Um, and this is particularly important because the Maestro and MEA technology provides a label-free and non-invasive uh, way to measure the electrophysiological changes of the cells. And what this means is that the electrodes are not modifying the biology when performing the measurement, such that measurements can be made over the time scales of minutes, hours, days, or even weeks. The other half of the platform is the software, which is the Axion Integrated Studio, or AXIS, software suite. AXIS provides a simple and easy to use interface for both data acquisition and analysis. And we'll step through some of the aspects of the software that make it a, 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 an extremely valuable tool. The first is that you're able to visualize data from every electrode in the plate. Here we're seeing raw data for each electrode uh, within a well. Uh, this panel here illustrates the raw activity, the raw voltage trace from a single, uh, single electrode. In addition, you're, there are flexible data visualization options so that you can look at data not just um, uh, from the single raw trace, but also um, using um, this panel to, to visualize process data and then the plate map functionality um, for viewing all 768 electrodes at once. In addition, with built-in configurations and simple controls, uh, you're able to both acquire and analyze data in a high-throughput fashion uh, faster than ever before. So now I'd like to take a brief moment to go through uh, the raw voltage data and the metrics that we're able to extract um, using access from this data. As we mentioned before, uh, briefly, the raw voltage data reflects the electrophysiological changes um, that, are, that are occurring from each cell uh, located nearby the electrodes. By processing this data, we're able to uh, detect single action potentials, which here the timing of the action potentials is marked by the individual tick marks in what's called a raster plot. By simply counting up these uh, action potentials or this, the tick marks in this raster, we're able to compute a value called the mean firing rate. And this is an, a general estimate of how uh, active that particular uh, neuron is. And we can go beyond just counting the, uh, counting the spikes and getting an overall level of activity by understanding how the spikes are grouped in time. Where uh, here we're showing a rapid succession of bursts, a, a rapid succession of spikes in a short period of time that is a burst or called a burst. Once a burst has been identified, we're able to uh, compute metrics related to bursting, such as the duration and the frequency with which the bursts occur. We can extend this across the full multi-electrode array 
by looking at the entire well. In this case, we have a well raster where each of these uh, lines in the raster uh, is similar, uh, is a reflection of a single electrode within the array. In much the same way we did with single electrode recordings, we can compute uh, bursting activity, uh, uh, including the duration and frequency of the bursts uh, that occur across the entire array or the entire network, and also use uh, quantitative synchrony measures to understand fine time scale coordination across, uh, across the neurons within the well. And AXIS automatically computes all of these neural endpoints, making advanced analysis simple and accessible. And once you have these neural endpoints, you're able to evaluate how uh, particular perturbations of the network influence those endpoints, such as pharma pharmacological manipulations or disease and addition models. So using these metrics, there's a, uh, a number of applications that are available uh, with the Maestro, uh, including neurotoxicity screening, drug discovery, uh, and functional disease models. Today, in particular, we'll hear about two uh, example disease models that have been illustrated on the Maestro platform so far, uh, autism spectrum disorders and pain. In addition, there's a number of other uh, disease models that have been demonstrated on the Maestro platform, ranging from Alzheimer's, epilepsy, to schizophrenia. If you'd like more information on any of these disease models that are not mentioned today, or in general about the Maestro um, MEA technology and its application to, uh, to advancing neuroscience, please visit the product and applications pages at axionbiosystems.com. Uh, and if you have any additional questions, please feel free to contact us at info at axionbio.com. And finally, I'd like to uh, introduce a few new um, products that will be coming later this year, and that is an automation platform for automated cell culture and experimentation, and also the LUMOS, a multi-well light delivery de device designed specifically for optogenetic applications. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. If you have questions for Dr. Millard, please submit them at any time. I will hold all the questions until after all the speakers are finished. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Carol Marchetto, a senior staff scientist in the laboratory of Dr. Fred Gage at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in La Jolla, California. Carol is currently studying the behavior of different subtypes of human neurons in neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric diseases, such as autism spectrum disorders and schizophrenia. I will now turn it over to Dr. Marchetto for her presentation about network level signaling in an in vitro autism model. Hello, I'm Carol Marchetto, and I'd like to thank Axion Biosystem for inviting me to talk today and LabRoots for hosting this webinar and the attendees that are listening to us now. Uh, I would like to start by giving you a little background on our motivation to look for alternative models to study neurological diseases. If you or someone you know is diagnosed with a neurodevelopmental, neuropsychiatric, or neurodegenerative disease, the likelihood of having any effective drug available in the market for you is really low. The reality is that approximately 90% of drug candidates fail at clinical trials due to issues in safety and efficacy. And one reason for the failure of many drug candidates is the human, in the human system is the poor predictivity of the preclinical models, biological models. Um, that is to say that existing models to test new therapeutic compounds new, or new drug candidates are limited. Unlike most cells of your body, we cannot remove brain cells from patients without causing major consequences. Postmortem tissues lack functional information and represent the end point of the disease, leaving questions with regards to the initiating or causal events. MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, can provide dynamic and functional information, but the resolution is not enough to detect single cell activity. Peripheral tissues, such as blood, are not the target tissue where the disorder manifests. And finally, rodent models allows us to study some of the genetic components of the disorder, but the typical human behavior components present in such, such as communication, social impairments, delusions, can't be easily studied in the rodent model. So we have the current feel that 
combining reprogramming technology with functional analysis provided by platforms such as the Axiom Multi Electrode Array technology can provide additional information to the previous models described and potentially allow for better understanding of human neurological disease biology and potential discovery of new targets and even testable drugs in the future. Today, specifically, I will be telling you about two promising studies in our lab where we aim to model two different neurological diseases. In the first part, I'll show you that IPS-derived models from autism spectrum disorder patients or idiopathic autism have, already, have altered activity. In the second part of my talk, I'll show you the data from our attempt to model drug responsiveness in vitro using IPS-derived neurons from patients with bipolar disorder. So we use a specific system in the lab uh, to differentiate neural cells from patients with autism. We obtained biopsies from eight autistic uh, patients and five Asian gender matched controls from the group of Eric Kuchesny from UCSD Autism X Center for Excellence. We then reprogrammed the lines into IPS and subsequently differentiated them into neurons via a neuroprogenitor intermediate state. When we probe the neurons from mark we then probe the neurons from markers for glutamatergic synapses, which are excitatory, uh, exemplified here by uh, VGLUT1. Uh, and based on our previous work with neurons derived from rat syndrome patients that were also included under the umbrella of autistic spectrum disorder, we predicted that the glutamatergic excitatory synapses could be altered in idiopathic autism. Indeed, we have noticed a significant decrease in the density of glutamatergic synapses per neurite length in the ASD compared to controls. Because we wanted to simultaneously record the neuronal activity from eight autistic patients and five controls, we decided to turn to the multi-electrode platform where we could compare multiple cell lines at the same time. We, the image shown here, shown here uh, shows a representative spike raster plot from 10 channels uh, from one well plated with control cultures over 30 days and or 50 days after differentiation. As you can see, control lines have a tendency of increasing the number of spikes, which are those uh, little um, ticks, individual ticks that you see uh, in, in any channel, in every channel. Um, and also, uh, they increase the bursts over time. To facilitate visualization and multiple comparisons, we collapsed all the spikes from, the ch from one channel and superimposed further with the uh, autism uh, sample. Uh, this work was done in collaboration with uh, B.F. Freitas and the Alison Watches lab in UCSD. When we, over, when we overimposed the uh, ASD derived neural networks to the control, uh, we noticed that at 30 days of differentiation, we could already detect a tendency for decreased activity of ASD neurons. At 50 days after differentiation, we detected a significant decrease in both spike number as well as network bursts, defined here as a sequence of 10 spikes over 100 milliseconds. We then asked if we were able to rescue the neuronal activity deficits in autism. Insulin growth factor called our attention for a couple of reasons as a candidate for a rescuing effects. Uh, insulin, IGF-1, had been shown to improve rat syndrome defective phenotype in mouse model and in patient neurons in vitro. And also, uh, IGF-1 has already shown in vitro, in vivo, and in vivo, and also IGF-1 is already uh, used, being used in clinical trials for idiopathic autism, rat syndrome, felon mcdermic syndrome, and fragile X. We then uh, treated our, decided to treat our uh, colonies, our differentiating neurons, with IGF-1. And we added IGF-1 on day uh, 58 after differentiation. We did uh, detect a positive effect of IGF-1 treatment in ASD cells, 
partially rescuing the decreased neuronal activity. Interestingly, there seems to be a differentiation response to IGF-1 treatment specific to different patients, indicating the possibility of patient-tailored therapies. As you can see here in the bottom panel graph, different uh, lines, colors, uh, represent different autistic patients. Able, Arch, Aqua, and Iro are just um, fictional names for our patients. And as you can see, Able, the black and the red Iro respond differently to IGF-1 treatment compared to the yellow and the blue Arch and Aqua lines. So in summary, for part one, AST derived neurons show decreased connectivity in vitro. We showed reduced, reduced synaptogenesis, altered levels of excitatory neurotransmitters, functional defects in neural networks that can be selectively rescued with IGF-1. The ASD in vitro model could be used to study difference in neuronal maturation during a critical period in autism that could not be feasible to study during human development. The model, we think, could reveal potential biomarkers for diagnosis as well as intervention and a pre at a pre-symptomatic stage and could be potentially used for drug screening. So next, um, we turned into um, to study another neuropsychiatric disease which has very little treatment available, and this is bipolar disorder. We um, generated in the lab IPSCs from fibroblasts from bipolar patients that were responsive or non-responsive to lithium treatment and from controls. Lithium is one of the few drugs used for bipolar disorder and works as a mood stabilizer. And our patients were screened and biopsies were performed under the supervision of John Kelso in UCSD. We then use the protocol that we have previously developed in the lab, uh, a modified differentiation protocol to generate an enriched population of dentate gyrus uh, granule cells neurons using a combination of anticaudalizing factors and enrichment for those of our brain. With this protocol, we were able uh, to enrich our population of dentate gyrus neurons, and we developed a reporter that allowed us to visualize live hippocampal granule neurons, and the reporter consists of a viral factor containing a dentate-specific promoter, which is called PROX1, and expresses a green fluorescent protein, so we can visualize dentate gyrus uh, neurons in the cultures. We then previously in the lab work from uh, Jun Yao and Jerome Mertens showed that hippocampal dentagyrus neurons derived from bipolar patients have hyperexcitability by electrophysiology, and this is shown here by a decrease in action potential thresholds in B. Uh, moreover, those uh, cells, the bipolar cells, both uh, lithium responsive and non responsive, showed lower threshold, so show an uh, increased number of evoked action potentials. And those are sample traces of current injection evoked action potentials in the bottom. Um, additionally, the two bipolar uh, groups were able to uh, had hyperexcitability and only the Lithium treatment reversed only hyper hyperactivity in the bipolar patients, in the responsive group, but not in the non-responsive group, showing in the bottom two uh, graphs. We then wanted to confirm the observations that we made with traditional pachyclum techniques and also look at dynamic change in the network of BD neurons over time. Uh, so we used... Um, MEA system for a pilot experiment. We started the recording as early as five days after differentiation and detected a sharp increase, a sharp increase in the spike number at day nine, confirming the early hyperexcitability phenotype on BD patients previously detected in ECs. We then treated the cells 
with lithium on day 12, and we wanted to see if we could recover uh, the hyperexcitability selectively in responsive patients. And important to point out here, we performed uh, those experiments in 96 well plate, uh, MEA 96 well plate, which allowed us to have uh, a lot of replicates to uh, test. We then um, looked at, to our surprise, we wanted to uh, do a time course after lithium treatment, and to our surprise, only three hours after lithium treatment exposure was sufficient to decrease the number of spikes on lithium responsive, but not on lithium non-responsive cells, as shown here in the bottom um, bar graph. The same effect was carried on after 24 hours of lithium treatment. We are currently investigating how long these effects will last, uh, but nonetheless, our preliminary data indicates that MEA technology could be used to probe patient drug responsiveness. In summary, in part two, uh, we show that hyperexcitability in bipolar disorder, neurons from bipolar disorder patients uh, occurs very early before even two weeks post differentiation in both lithium responsive and non responsive patients. And lithium effects on the hyperexcitability phenotype is detected only on lithium responsive cells as fast as three hours after drug addition. These results are encouraging to develop a functional assay for drug testing during using the reduction of the hyperexcitability that we've seen in bipolar neurons as a readout. And I'd like to close uh, acknowledging um, Fred Gage Lab and Fred Gage, uh, specifically Renata Santos, Jerome Mertens, Ruth Offner, and Anna Mendes were directly involved in this project that I uh, talked about. Our collaborator collaborators, Alison Wachi and uh, Dia Freitas in UCSD, uh, Kristen Brennan in Mount Sinai Hospital, New York, Eric Kuchesny and Karen Pierce in UCSD Autism Center for, Le for Excellence, Jun Yao in Tsuhua University, China, and John Kelsall in SESTI. And uh, many thanks for uh, you for watching us. Thank you, Dr. Marchetto, for that interesting presentation. Now we'll hear from Dr. John Grave, a senior research investigator at Bristol Myers Squibb in Connecticut. He's focused on using multi-electrode array platforms to develop in vitro efficacy assays for multiple discovery programs. I will now turn it over to Dr. Grace for his presentation on pain modeling using muscle root ganglion cells. All right, thanks, Stacy, for that introduction, and uh, thank you, Axion and Lab Roots, for uh, organizing this webinar. So uh, today, what I want to focus on the last part of this webinar is uh, our how we've been using this MEA system from Axion to basically try to create a, a pain in a dish model uh, using embryonic rat dorsal root ganglion neurons. So Daniel did a nice job giving an overview of the MEA system and what, uh, what the capabilities are, so I won't uh, belabor these few introductory slides too much, but I wanted to show just an example of one well of DRG activity in the lower right-hand corner there showing real-time spontaneous activity from uh, DRG neurons uh, and what this looks like uh, across the whole plate. So this would be a 48-well MEA plate, and you can see uh, by this heat map as activity pops up in real time <clears throat> across the MEA plate. So, and Daniel also did a nice job showing the types of uh, metrics that can be pulled out from the MEA recordings. And I, I just want to basically reiterate here how, uh, at least in, in my view, how valuable all these different metrics can be. So since a priori, you don't know exactly what metric is going to be the most relevant when comparing different conditions or different cell types. It's nice to be able to pull out all these different metrics and, and, and look at them post hoc and find out what might be the most relevant one. And so this is just showing, again, from a single spike train, all the different uh, uh, measurements you can pull out from those individual spikes, as well as the burst characteristics. And Daniel also mentioned that uh, we can look at network analysis. So again, looking at synchronous activity, cross-correlation, uh, and, and, and quantifying network bursts is also an, an important aspect of how these different networks uh, interact. Uh, and another thing I wanted to highlight, too, is something that we've been also looking at in ter is terms of uh, uh, functional connections. 
And so here we're actually looking at uh, significantly correlated individual neurons or electrodes, looking at those functional connections and seeing how those change over time, and then also looking at this propagation speed between these connections is, is another potential metric, uh, of, of, uh, a potential phenotype for uh, in different conditions. So when we started doing this work, a lot of this, uh, our, our analysis was done before uh, Axion came out with their, their nice uh, neuronal uh, analysis program. So we had used our own custom MATLAB analysis program. Uh, and what we were doing here was we were actually taking the, the spike files, which can be exported from the Axis software. And this, this basically gives you information on when the spike occurs and the waveform of that spike. And so you can extrapolate all the type of uh, metrics or data from that, uh, from that spike file. So we would import it into our uh, analysis program and then export CSV files and then read this into a program called Spotfire for data visualization. And this allowed us to uh, basically look at how these metrics change over time easily uh, and do multi-parametric analysis to see how the different metrics, uh, how, how they're affected in, in, in different cell types or, or different treatment conditions. And another thing that we've had, uh, uh, we, we've started doing, especially with the DRG neurons, uh, is actually doing some spike sorting based upon amplitude. And so uh, sometimes you get, because these DRGs like, like to cluster around electrodes, you'll get multiple neurons firing on one electrode. And to be able to sort these spikes out uh, individually based upon their amplitude has allowed us to get a more uh, sort of clean up our data in terms of the, the, the variability that we sometimes see and, and we can look at how those individual uh, units are being affected over time. Uh, and just to kind of show you what the comparison looks like, so this, we went back and reanalyzed some of our data using our custom ATLEG pro program with the, the newer Axion uh, neural metrics program. And there's a very nice uh, overlay between these two in terms of the, the metrics looking here in terms of cross-correlation. Uh, and, and also uh, identifying burst and burst rate. And so there's a nice correlation between these two, uh, these two analysis programs, uh, suggesting that, uh, that the data that, uh, is, is being analyzed in, in, a, in a similar fashion. So now jumping into our assay. So as I mentioned before, we wanted to basically create a pain in a dish model using these dorsal root ganglion. And so these, these DRG neurons, basically the, uh, they, uh, are clushed within a ganglion, or the cell bodies within a ganglion outside the CNS, uh, alongside the spinal cord, um, as you can see here. Uh, that's the wrong one, as you can see here. I'm sorry. Uh, and so basically the, the role that these uh, DRG neurons play is to transmit sensory information from the periphery. Uh, along uh, the axon to the cell body and then into this, the central nervous system, uh, the spinal cord and the dorsal horn of the spinal cord and then transmit that information up into, uh, up into the brain. And as you can see from this, this cartoon and from this review, um, there are several different ion channels involved uh, in propagating uh, and integrating these signals uh, along the DRG up into the brain. And so there are a lot of different potential uh, targets here that can be uh, different t channels that can be targeted for, uh, for potential pain, neuropathic pain states. And so that, these DRG neurons, they exhibit little spontaneous activity under normal conditions. However, following nerve injury or inflammation is where we start to see hyperexcitability or ectopic spontaneous discharges, which uh, can be transmitted to the, the spinal cord and the brain, signaling pain when pain isn't present, and these, this can underline certain neuropathic states. And so really our goal here was to, using the MEA system, create a spontaneously active or hyperactive dorsal root ganglion in a dish so we can then use, uh, we can then look at different targets within these DRG neurons and see how well certain uh, compounds are at, uh, uh, inhibiting this, this spontaneous activity. So our early attempts at, at looking at DRG activity were, uh, were not too successful. So the animations you see here is just with evoked activity. So we were able to evoke activity with uh, some trip uh, channel agonists such as capsaicin and methanol. Uh, and you can see there the, uh, uh, the activity that was evoked. But uh, we really were not able to see any spontaneous activity 
uh, at several different plating densities. And once we elicited activity, uh, the, the, the spontaneous act, any, uh, that activity was no longer present after uh, an initial, you know, 30 seconds to a minute. So this wasn't a, a very good uh, assay at first to try to, to test the effects of different compounds. And so we, we wanted to uh, work on developing uh, this assay so we can get robust spontaneous activity. And, uh, and I'll walk you the next few slides what we did to, to recreate that. Uh, we also, the next step was to actually add nerve growth factor, or NGF, to the cultures. Uh, and as you can see here, this did lead to small amounts of variable spontaneous activity. This is from a 12-well plate, uh, and you can see just small uh, bits of, of spontaneous activity popping up by, by the heat map. And again, this was not uh, this was not ideal. So the next step we did was to actually look at uh, adding some antimitotic agents to prevent swan cell proliferation and to kind of help the, the DRG stay adhere uh, and, and not come off of the MEA plate. Uh, and this did lead to uh, an increase in uh, the number of active electrodes that we were picking up on the MEA. Uh, we were able to induce more activity with a, a, a non-selective potassium channel blocker to further depolarize the DRG neurons for AP. Uh, and this did increase uh, activity to a certain extent, but this, we still did not feel this was ideal in terms of having a, a big enough window in terms of activity that we could uh, push the activity higher or push the activity lower to kind of really test the effects of either inhibiting or uh, increasing spontaneous activity within the DRG, uh, DRG cells. And so really what it kind of came down to was just we just added a little salt to our, uh, our, our cultures. Uh, and, and what we had noticed is that we, we were culturing in uh, standard neurobasal medium. We were recording in neurobasal medium. Uh, and the, the sodium chloride concentration in, in neurobasal was, was relatively low compared to what uh, is typically used in other artificial CSF preps or uh, what's physiologically relevant. And so just by uh, supplementing our, our neurobasal medium with some sodium chloride, bringing the, the concentration up to a, a more relevant 140 millimolar concentration, uh, we were able to get really robust spontaneous activity, which you can kind of see here on the lower left uh, on the heat map, getting nice activity in all wells of, of the 12-well plate. And this did uh, persist over time. So you can see on the graph in the lower right-hand corner, uh, starting at DIV11, this stands for days in vitro, so this is 11 days in culture. Uh, we have robust activity, which seems to last out past, past two weeks. And so here we finally felt that we had a nice, robust assay, good spontaneous activity in our DRGs, uh, and now we were able to actually go in and probe uh, the underlying channels and receptors that were involved in the spontaneous activity and how we could target those uh, to either reduce that activity or to increase it. And so uh, oh yeah, and as far as uh, another uh, development uh, aspect, we, we looked at different plating densities. And so when we had sort of optimized our culture conditions, uh, we were able to plate at lower plating densities uh, and, and still get good spontaneous activity. So here you can see a, a density dependent uh, increase in active electrodes and spontaneous activity as we're just covering more of the MEA grid. And you can see in the upper, the inset in the upper right hand corner, uh, a nice picture of the, the MEA uh, grid, the individual uh, electrode here. Uh, and then you can also see individual dorsal root ganglion uh, right here. Uh, and so this is what, uh, at 50,000. DRGs per well uh, plated directly on top of the electrode, we're able to get nice activity, uh, and this looks uh, uh, look like a good a good assay to move forward with. So, and just kind of quantifying this uh, over time, uh, looking at different plating densities, uh, we can see that the activity does increase over time. Uh, from starting at uh, about four days in vitro all the way out to two weeks in vitro. Uh, and again, this is just in, in the table at the bottom. This kind of quantifies uh, all the different metrics that we were that we were looking at. And so you can see that we get a pretty decent amount of active electrodes per MEA, where about half of our electrodes are uh, picking up spontaneous activity. The spike rate, uh, once we do the actual spike sorting, uh, it, it's it's not it, you know it's they fired about one you know one hertz, so they're not firing at, at high rates like you might see with. Uh, hippocampal or cortical cultures. 
and also, in contrast to hippocampal and cortical cultures, you can see here uh, in terms of the connectivity, the, the cross-correlation probability, and the, uh, the functional uh, network connections uh, below that, that these DRGs really aren't networked up. They're sort of autonomous uh, neurons and just, just firing mostly in a tonic state, just firing single axe potentials. Uh, but they do have some bursting activity, which you can see here, it's not that much. We got about three bursts per minute on average from these DRG neurons. So essentially they're not forming uh, functional synaptic connections where uh, in a hippocampal or cortical neuronal culture you would, you would typically see that. But these, they're forming ganglion and they're just, they're, they're, they're spontaneously uh, firing action potentials uh, in, a, in more of a tonic manner instead of, in a, in a, in a, uh, uh, instead of bursting. Uh, and then, so the next uh, few slides, are, we basically decided to do a, a whole lot of pharmacology to really profile these DRGs, uh, these embryonic rat DRGs on the MEA system to see what uh, channels are involved in the spontaneous activity, what channels can be targeted, how can we increase uh, this activity. Uh, and you can see here using the TRIP-V1 uh, agonist capsation uh, that we do have a nice dose response in terms of increasing do uh, doses of capsation will lead to increasing spike rates. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see here, so again, this is comparing uh, the just straight neurobasal media versus the spike neurobasal media uh, with sodium chloride, and you can see comparing the two gray bars there at 37 degrees Celsius, physiological uh, temperature, that there is that increase in activity. Uh, and we do have the, the neurobasal spike with sodium chloride. We can uh, increase uh, the temperature. Uh, so this, the MEA system does have is temperature controlled. We can increase the temperature and activate the TRIB-V1 receptor, and we do see a nice increase in activity as well. So here, just a couple examples of how we can even boost the spontaneous activity even further, or, or the overall activity rate even further. Uh, we next wanted to uh, look at, the, again, the different ion channels involved in this activity. And so, uh, first of all, we wanted to look at sodium channels. And so it's been shown that DRG have both TTX, tetrodotoxin uh, resistant, and tetrodotoxin sensitive NAV channels. And so we wanted to look at how TTX affected uh, the spontaneous activity within these cultures. And we looked at two different time points early on at seven days in culture or seven DIV and then at, at, at two weeks uh, in culture. And you can see at seven days in culture, that's the light gray uh, circles in uh, figure in, in panel A, uh, that it does show a nice dose response in terms of inhibiting its activity, and that this uh, shifts to the left, becoming more potent at 14 days, suggesting that these TTX sensitive channels have a, uh, a greater contribution to the spontaneous activity as the cultures mature. Uh, and just to kind of make, our, make ourselves feel good, uh, we wanted to uh, record, do a whole cell patch recording from uh, an MEA plate. And so we used the MEA to uh, identify a, a, a fairly active DRG neuron. We went in and we patched the cell. Uh, and you can see the results of that are in panel B at baseline. We can, again, we can see that there is nice spontaneous action potentials that are popping up at baseline. And again, we can block this with TTX basic validating that we are picking up action potentials and that are TTX sensitive uh, on the MEA. Uh, we next wanted to try to uh, tease apart the different subtypes uh, that are involved in, in uh, sodium channel subtypes that are involved in the spontaneous activity. Uh, the, the TTX sensitive uh, subtypes being uh, 1.3, 1.6, 1.7. Uh, where the TTX resistant being 1.8, 1.9, and, uh, and and so our first experiment was to look at protoxin 2, and this is a, a peptide isolated from tarantula venom, which is supposedly selective for NAV 1.7, uh, and at this concentration of 10 nanomole, which you can see here in panel C, and so kind of in line with uh, our results from panel A early on, protoxin 2 was not. Uh, did not do a, as well of a job inhibiting spontaneous activity, but at two days, at two weeks in culture, we see that there is a nice inhibition of activity, suggesting that the 1.7 subunit has a greater contribution at later time points in the culture. Uh, we also wanted to look at NAV 1.8, a TTX resistant channel, uh, and again here using this compound A803467, which is 
selective for, for NAV 1.8. You can see at an earlier time point, uh, seven days in culture, the light gray bars, it's uh, fairly potent with an IC50 of around 150 nanomolar. Uh, however, at a later time point, this is, uh, it is, it's shifted to the right, suggesting it's not as potent uh, with an IC50 greater than a micromolar, and this might be non, uh, uh, non-selective effects out here. So again, this, this lines up with TTX-resistant channels having more of a contribution early on, and TTX-sensitive channels having more of a contribution uh, as these cultures mature. Uh, we also want to look at uh, calcium channels. And so here we looked at both high-threshold calcium channels, which are, are, are N, L, and R-type uh, calcium channels, as well as low-threshold calcium channels, or, or T-type calcium channels. Uh, and as you can see here in panel A, uh, we, looked at both, we looked at nifedipine at a couple different concentrations and an L-type calcium channel, which did not uh, have much of an effect at 3, nan 3 micromolar, but was able to inhibit activity at 10 micromolar. Uh, we looked at the N-type uh, uh, selective toxin, uh, peptide, uh, conotoxin uh, MB, uh, MB, or M7A, and you can see here that at 1 micromolar and 3 micromolar, there was not much of an effect with N-type. Uh, and the same thing with the R-type, uh, the SNX482 um, uh, peptide. And again, you can see there's not much of an effect with, uh, with, these, with these compounds. And so this... The 10 micromolar effect with nifedipine was probably could potentially be due to effects of T-type calcium channels because uh, at, at these higher concentrations, nifedipine does seem to does have an effect on, on T-type calcium channels. And so that was our next couple of experiments. We wanted to see look, look specifically at these low threshold T-type calcium channels. And uh, in panel B, you can see mebetrodil, which is a selective T-type calcium channel blocker. Uh, is able to fully inhibit the spontaneous activity in the DRG neurons, uh, as well as nickel chloride also uh, is able to actually inhibit uh, network bursts. So remember, they don't burst as much, but uh, we are able to in inhibit a, a, a burst rate with nickel chloride, which is more selective for the CAP 3.2 subtype. So uh, from this, uh, we basically concluded that the, the high threshold calcium channels were not uh, involved in, in much in the spontaneous uh, activity, whereas the T-type calcium channels were. Uh, we also looked at uh, uh, potassium channel uh, compounds as well. So uh, lenopyridine, which is an M-channel M blocker. This, this blocks the M-current, uh, the potassium M-current. You can see the nice dose response here in terms of increasing activity. Uh, you can see that these, these cells become very active when you increase uh, concentrations of lenopyridine. Uh, as well as with 4IP uh, data that was kind of shown earlier. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the, the increase in activity uh, with, with the 4IP application. And so here again, just demonstrating that we can increase activity with potassium channel uh, blockers. Uh, and yeah, quickly just wanted to also that, that these HCN channels are, have also been shown to play a role in, in DRG excitability. We looked at one in particular, ZD7288. Uh, and you can see it does have an effect on spontaneous activity, um, whereas this, you know, th these results could be confounded with the potential effects on NAV channels, which have been shown uh, in earlier slides to, in to decrease activity. Um, so again, this, these were a little hard to interpret, it, but uh, at higher concentrations, you can see out here, uh, this might potentially be due to uh, effects on HCN channels. So they may, may play a role uh, as well with uh, DRG excitability in, uh, in, this, in this prep. Uh, so moving on from ion channels to actual receptors, uh, and we wanted to look at the sort of the neurotransmitter profile within these cultures. And so obviously the first things we wanted to, to examine were the effects of glutamate and GABA uh, in, in these cultures. And so if you focus on the bottom uh, right-hand uh, graph here, you can see that uh, the effects of GABA glutamate and NMDA uh, in the red, green, and, and brown, respectively, really had no effect on activity. Uh, whereas we, if we applied bradykinin, uh, this had a, a rather robust increase uh, in activity. Uh, the, the effects of substance P as well in orange are shown in which they also did not have uh, an effect on um, increasing activity. So the correlate to this, looking at the antagonists for these receptors, if we focus on uh, the, the red, 
uh, green and, and, and uh, brown bars right here. Again, this, this lines up nicely with no effect of actual GABA glutamate or NMDA application. We similarly do not see an effect of those respective antagonists for those receptors. Uh, we did see what was interesting, though, uh, we used some neurokinin 1 and 2 antagonists uh, which actually completely uh, abolished activity, as you can see here. So it looks like sub substance P is a neurokinin uh, ligand. You can add substance P. You don't see uh, activity, increases in activity, but if you add the antagonist to these receptors, you completely abolish it, select, you know, suggesting that, there, that the, the culture may have sort of already saturated with some sort of neurokinin ligand, uh, and you are able to decrease, basically inhibit activity by blocking those receptors. Uh, it's also interesting to see that with uh, a bradykinin, a, a B2 bradykinin receptor antagonist specifically, that we don't see uh, much of an effect here, suggesting there aren't any really functional bradykinin 2 receptors. Uh, I mean, I'm suggesting that there's really no bradykinin within, endogenous bradykinin within this culture, uh, and it's only once it's, um, you add it exogenously uh, do you see a robust increase uh, in activity levels. Uh, so we wanted to also kind of probe using bradykinin as, as an insult or a, uh, uh, to these cultures to really increase uh, activity. And so that's what this is showing here uh, on this slide. And so we'll just uh, focus here on this bottom uh, graph. And so you can see under control conditions, we see, again, a nice robust increase with bradykinin, one micromole of bradykinin. Uh, if we pretreat with these different uh, compounds that can block activity, such as retigabine, which actually is a potassium channel opener uh, to hyperpolarize the cells, and you can see the dose response there in the upper right-hand corner. This inhibits activity, uh, and then if you add bradykinin, we really do not see that robust increase in activity. Uh, same thing with the substance, uh, with the neurokinin uh, antagonist and with PTX. Uh, once you inhibit spontaneous activity with these with these compounds, you really cannot uh, induce activity with bradykinin. Uh, it's also interesting to see that the bradykinin-2 selective antagonist, when 64338 uh, at one micromolar partially uh, blocks the, uh, the bradykinin-induced activity, and at 10 micromolar, basically what we can see here is that we're fully inhibiting the bradykinin-induced activity without affecting sort of underlying spontaneous activity, which lines up with what we saw previously. Uh, so you can uh, fully block this bradykinin-evoked activity with this uh, B2 receptor antagonist. Uh, and it's finally, so in order to kind of uh, validate this model uh, for, for pain, you know, we looked at some uh, different compounds that have been used in the clinic for, for pain, such as carbamazepine, amitriptyline, and, dul and duloxetine. And you can see here in the upper right, uh, upper left-hand corner that we do see nice dose responses with these three compounds. They're able to inhibit spontaneous activity. Uh, we also looked at gabapentin, which is shown on the right-hand side. This did have, uh, you know, did have a, a significant effect uh, at a high concentration of one millimolar starting at 24 hours and at four days post. So this lends some credence to this uh, assay being used to characterize different uh, pain therapeutics. Uh, you'll notice in the table at the bottom here, we did look at morphine and this had no effect. Uh, and this kind of lines up with morphine acting more centrally uh, for, it, for its analgesic effect. Um, and so uh, that, that lines up with what we were, when we were looking at just a, at a population of DRG neurons that, 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 that made sense in this assay. Uh, and you know, one final thing I just wanted to note. So a lot of our compounds that we look at, we do have to dissolve in DMSO, but what was interesting is DMSO itself can acutely increase activity, and you kind of kind of see that there as we add DMSO, that animation, we get a nice robust, albeit transient, increase in activity. Uh, but if you look about 20, 30 minutes post DMSO, and we did serial additions of different concentrations of DMSO, you can see that it does tend to return to baseline. So you can get a good read on the effects of compounds uh, if you have to add in DMSO uh, after about 20, 30 minutes. Uh, and so really that's, that's uh, all I had. And to kind of summarize what, you know, what we've done with this assay, you know, we've, we basically optimized it to get good spontaneous activity of these DRG neurons. We see optimal activity anywhere from one and a half to two weeks in culture at about 50,000 cells per well for actual MEA. Uh, they, they, sh they show um, 
you can you can both en enhance and inhibit activity with different uh, different ion channel blockers as, as well as different peptides, um, and that uh, this activity can be blocked by compounds that have been used in the clinic for chronic pain. Um, and so this does represent a, a you know a platform that's physiologically relevant and you know a functional in vitro pain assay that can be used for characterizing compounds. And so I think really may, kind of want to harp on the point that this really is looking at uh, endogenous uh, excitability within within these DRGs, since there doesn't seem to be much uh, neurotransmitter release, anything that's going to target uh, that that's, that pathway in the, in the spinal cord for neurotransmitter release, such as these higher threshold calcium channels would not be expected to have an effect, as we showed, but this really is looking at intrinsic excitability of the DRGs and how you can actually target that um, uh, to, to reduce uh, spontaneous activity and hopefully reduce um, ectopic pain discharges. Uh, and with that, my final slide, just want to acknowledge the, the people here uh, that, that helped with this work uh, at, at BMS, uh, which are shown there, and also acknowledge, uh, you know, Daniel Axion and uh, Matthew Brock as well, who also helped uh, at early days at, at Axion with, with a lot of this, uh, you know, assay development and, and data analysis. So uh, with that, uh, I'll conclude. All right. Thank you, John, for that interesting presentation. Uh, before we get started on the question and answer session, I just want to remind everyone how to submit the questions. Uh, you can submit your question by typing them in the Q&A box, um, which you can find on the by clicking the green Q&A button at the lower left. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. So our first question here is a general question about systems, uh, which I'm going to direct to um, Dr. Millard. Is MEA and this maestro system applicable only to cell culture or also to brain slices? That's a great question. Um, while it is possible to perform slice-based experiments, uh, particularly in, in uh, the 12 well format where there are larger wells, in general, the Maestro uh, was designed for cell culture um, with the goal in mind of significantly increasing the throughput with which um, customers could get at uh, answers to their scientific questions. Okay, thank you. Um, this next question is for um, Dr. Marchetto. Um, do you find that the MEA data correlates well with single cell action potential data, especially considering the heterogeneity of the cells? Uh, so, Perry, field potential with uh, – great question. Perry, we've, we've been trying to tackle that problem for a while now, and we are uh, recruiting a, a few computational biologists in our lab to try to um, – uh, combine data sets from uh, those two different sources. Uh, combining pairing field potential with single action potential is uh, uh, challenging, especially for human neurons, um, because exactly the heterogeneity. Um, however, our uh, patch clumping data compared fr from bipolar disease patients uh, uh, comparing with the field potentials from bipolar indicates that at least everything is moving into the same trend. So I um, can't answer you precisely right now, uh, but we we think that they are uh, correlated as far as we can tell right now. But we're still investigating it further. All right, thank you. Um, this next one is again for um, Dr. Millard. Does the MEA discriminate activity from excitatory versus inhibitory neurons? <laughs> So that's a, a, another great question in that uh, many of the types of uh, neural cultures that people are interested in on the MEA do involve mixed populations of cell types. Um, in particular, cortical neurons, uh, cortical neuron cultures have a, a significant amount of both excitatory and inhibitory components. Um, I'll answer this question in, in, um, in, in two different ways. The first is that um, the bursting activity and, and overall network activity in general from a well is reflective of the relative contributions of excitatory and inhibitory neurons uh, and, and how they contribute to the activity. So an example of this is that uh, in a cortical neuron uh, culture, you might have a burst of activity. And if you used a pharmacological agent to inhibit the excitatory, inhibitory uh, components of that network, you find often that the burst duration is increased. Um, and if we think about this intuitively, it's because 
the inhibitory population within the network isn't able to do its job, which is to shut down uh, the burst of activity once the excitatory neurons uh, start the burst. So this is a, a, a simplistic example to illustrate that many of the metrics we discussed related to bursting and synchrony are directly reflective of the relative contributions of uh, the excitatory and inhibitory neurons within a population. And the second, I'll try and keep this brief, but we mentioned the LUMOS, which is a, a new multi-well light delivery device that will be later available later this year, which incorporates optogenetics. Uh, I won't go into the details of optogenetics, but for those that are aware, it's a tool that would allow you to selectively activate potentially one cell type versus another, uh, uh, and in this case, excitatory versus inhibitory neurons. Um, in this way, the LUMOS, would, it would be possible to activate selectively just the excitatory neurons, identify which electrodes uh, are, are detecting those responses, and then use that moving forward in your analysis to um, isolate those two distinct cell populations. All right, great. Thank you, Daniel. Um, this next one is for Dr. Gray. Um, a couple of similar questions here where uh, our, our audience is wondering if you're able to isolate single units from the multi-unit activity at each electrode, and kind of in conjunction with that, what is the diversity of your DRG neuron cell type? Do you, do you know the distribution of subtypes in your system? And can you tell the different effects on these different subtypes with your pharmacological manipulation? Yeah, no, that would be great. No, I wish I did. So, yeah, this is a very heterogeneous population uh, of cells, the DRG, small, medium, large diameter, pathogenic, non pathogenic And we don't have a way to, to do that right now, other than the, what Daniel was talking about earlier, to, to do different... Uh, uh, to transduce uh, in, in different cell types and then, and then stimulate there. So, no, we don't really know what... Um, what cell type, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at. And we haven't really investigated looking at the actual firing properties or the extracellular waveform properties and see if that correlates with a certain cell type. Um, and as far as trying to get single units, so, I, you know, I, I can't really say that we are actually getting, you know, we are really discriminating between all the units on the electrode. And so, Basically, we're doing a crude spike sorting in terms of amplitude right now, and, based, and what dictates how large the amplitude is is based upon how the proximity to the actual electrode. And so two electrodes that are, you know, in the same proximity, or two cells that are in the same proximity to the electrode are probably going to have a similar spike amplitude potentially. Uh, and so we can't really say we're actually discriminating between single units, but we try to, in those clear-cut cases, uh, to discriminate between uh, individual units. Okay, good, thank you. Um, this next one is for Dr. Marchetto. Are you sorting your cells for enrichment or hand selecting based on the GST reporter? And also, are you adding any glia? And how do you coat the plate uh, before laying down the cells? Um, uh, great questions. Uh, we are not yet selecting them on the GFP reporter for the experiments that I have shown. We are uh, starting to sort them into um, uh, in the next uh, follow-up experiments just to study specific subtypes of neurons isolated. Um, when we do that, we would add glia on the bottom uh, as coating, and we also coat the plates with uh, polyonistin laminin. Um, and that has been a, a, a general coating described in the literature. Um, we currently we don't use glia, but as soon as we would sort cells, the cells wouldn't necessarily survive very healthy without the glia. And the reason why we don't sort for glia, uh, uh, add glia right now is because our populations uh, have di differentiated from neuroprogenitor cells in the MEA plates have already uh, uh, a specific percentage of. Uh, glia cells there that is constant. Okay, thank you. Um, this next question is for Dr. Graves. Are compound activities comparable in recombinant cells versus DRG culture on MEA versus in vivo? Uh, yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, yeah, to a certain extent, yes. Yeah. So I, I, in, in recombinant cells, if you're looking at a particular channel, um, and so the potency you get on that channel in a recombinant cell, 
doesn't always track to the DRG, and again, because what you're, you're measuring in the MEA is just spontaneous activity, and so your IC50 value at that individual channel may not necessarily correlate with an IC50 value for effects on spontaneous activity. Sometimes it can be more potent uh, in the, the DRG assay, and sometimes it can be less potent, depending upon how, um, how, it's, you know, how it's expressed within the DRG and how it interacts with other channels. Uh, to, to um, you know, to, to contribute to the underlying excitability. As far as in vivo, and again in vivo, we do you know we see similar similarities across all three of those platforms in terms of what works on one tends to work on, you know, you know on in MEA as well as in vivo. It's just a matter of potency, and probably that's just a matter of, you know, whether it's getting getting to the target and in another, you know, PK properties that are involved in vivo. But yet for the most part, there is nice. Uh, there is nice alignment across recombinant cells, uh, DRG on MEA, and, and in vivo. Okay, thank you. Well, that's all the time we have for right now. So I would like to once again thank Dr. Miller, Dr. Marchetto, and Dr. Grace for their presentations today. And we'd also like to thank our sponsor, Axion Biosystems, for making today's webcast possible. Um, if we didn't get to your question today, we will receive the full list of questions within 24 hours, and we'll follow up with a reply to your question by the end of the week. Um, also, today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through April 7, 2016. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when the webcast is available for you to replay. So we invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event, and you can submit additional questions when replaying the webcast using that same screen Q&A button at the lower left. We will reply to those questions via email. So thank you again for your attendance, and we'll see you next time. Bye.